Honourable Members, question time will conclude today at 11.14 a.m. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. This financial year, health infrastructure investment is $1.47 billion. The budget reduces health infrastructure investment to $1.35 billion. Given the Australian Medical Association's warning of a ticking time bomb, why is Labor reducing health infrastructure in the middle of a health crisis? I call the Premier. Mr Speaker, as I said very clearly, um, we have a record health budget in Queensland. Yeah. Uh, over $22 billion, Mr yeah. Speaker. And of course, Mr Speaker, uh, there is money there to grow our frontline services and to look at the capital infrastructure that is needed across the state, Mr Speaker. This includes expansions to our hospitals in Ipswich, uh, on the, in Logan and Caboolture, Mr Speaker, the new uh, MARTA public hospital in Springfield that we were yeah. able to announce, Mr yeah. Speaker, uh, satellite hospitals across yeah. seven satellite hospitals, Mr Speaker, that I have, that I have been uh, coordinating with the Deputy Premier in Health to have them up and running within two years, Mr Speaker, because we know that people would like to go and get services close to home, Mr Speaker. And this is an Australian first, an Australian first to have satellite hospitals, Mr Speaker. And then, of course, we've also got, in addition to that, our $2 billion health infrastructure fund, Mr Speaker. And that's really important. And why is that important? Because, because Members Mr. to my Speaker, left. As, as, as business cases right. come to hand... The Treasurer hand, will put his comments through ready, the chair. We will be ready to invest the money that is needed to build those hospitals, Mr. Speaker, the land has the land. There's money there for the land of Bundaberg, Mr. Speaker. The day surgery at Toowoomba, Mr. Speaker, but also to those regional upgrades that are needed right across uh, the state. From memory, Mr. Speaker, uh, Charleville uh, up on Thursday Island. Leader of the opposition. Warabinda, Mr Speaker. So right across right across Queensland, that health infrastructure is absolutely critical, Mr Speaker. And more than I'll take an injection. But Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the people of this state back Queensland to deliver health services in this state, Mr Speaker. They back they back this government to keep them safe, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker, one can only imagine where Queenslanders would Order. be if they'd listened to the leader of Nanango and uh, and the member for Broadwater and and had those had those had those borders open sixty four times, Mr Speaker. Order, Mr. members. Nanango wants to be the leader again, Mr Speaker. Members to my left. Member for Kapalaba. Premier has the call. Thank you. And I take that interjection for the member for Kapalaba. A very good interjection, Mr Speaker. Because there are no good interjections, seat. Premier. This closed, absolutely closed the Barrett Adolescent Centre. They shut a really important hospital, closed it down, Mr Speaker, and people tragically lost their lives, Mr Speaker. On this side, we back health. We'll look after Queenslanders. Mr. Premier's Speaker, time has expired. Without, without. Mr Speaker, a question... I call the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. The Treasurer promised a $2 billion hospital building fund, but the budget details show this so-called fund doesn't have a funding allocation line and doesn't build a single new hospital. Can the Minister tell Queenslanders where is the money? I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, It's not surprising that before the budget and after the budget, those on the other side, side still don't understand basic accounting. But that's OK. That's OK, because they've, they've just... Order! <laughs> jealous. Jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous of you guys. <laughs> Minister for Health, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, we are very proud of our health budget this year, as we are of all of our health budgets. $2 billion hospital building fund. Hang on. Real money earmarked for real projects. Sorry. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. Members to my left. Members to my left, the uh, minister is being responsive to the question asked. Uh, you've asked the question, I ask that you hear the answer. 
The Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This funding is above Queensland Health's normal capital infrastructure program. It's about providing Queensland Health with secure funding source for projects to tackle growing demand. And can I advise the Leader of the Opposition, if he can just keep it Leader of the Opposition will cease his interjections. He'll find out. Now, let me just... Current allocations, Mr Speaker, including capital and upgrading funding, $42 million over the forward estimates for the Toowoomba Day Surgery in 2021. 2021-22, Toowoomba Day Surgery, $177 million over forward estimates to purchase the public health services through the expansion of the MARTA Public Hospital Springfield. $120 million over two years, 21 22 if he's Order. Sure, I can pause, tell you. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. <laughs> Members to my left, um, I hear the interjections which seem to be asking a particular question which has already been asked of the Minister. And in my uh, listening to the Minister's answer over the interjections, I believe the Minister is answering the question. So I would really ask you to cease those interjections, hear the answer, or I will start naming members. The Minister has the call. Ah, thank you, Mr Speaker. So $120 million over two years, 2021-22 budget, 2022-23, uh, for an uplift of QHealth-based capital program. The remaining balance of more than $1.7 billion can be... OK. Member for Kiwana, you're warned under standing orders. ..can be earmarked for future projects beyond the forward estimates. Mr Speaker, for example, the new Toowoomba Hospital. Detailed design is underway for a new Toowoomba Hospital. You would think those opposite might be interested in that. You might think they'd be saying thank you to Toowoomba Day Surgery, $42 million, and be pleased that there's detailed design work going into a new Toowoomba Hospital. The Bailey Henderson in Toowoomba North is our preferred site, and master planning continues. Of course, our planning work for the new uh, Bundaberg Hospital. We're doing the business case now, and a $2 billion ho uh, hospital building fund allows us the ability to draw forward the deputy leader of the opposition. when we need, when these business cases are finished, to start the construction of these major developments, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, we are very proud of the fact that we are establishing this fund above our normal capital above to invest beyond. in above additional capital for this state to take pressures off our road. system. And I'll take that interjection. Those opposite, zero planned, zero Minister's built, time no has expired. <laughs> Mr Speaker. I call the member for Moneyborough. My question is of the Premier and Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on the Palaszczuk government's strategy to rebuild Queensland's economy by investing in renewable energy? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank um, the, the member for the question, because, as he knows, uh, it is really important for North Queensland that um, renewable energy is great for regional jobs, Mr Speaker, and I know uh, all of our regional members support our 50% uh, renewable energy target by 2030, Mr Speaker, because what that means is jobs in regional Queensland. And we, we know that for many years those opposite uh, condemned those, uh, those projects that were happening on their, their, back, their back doors. But now, Mr Speaker, we see that um, our trend towards renewable energy is being driven by this government and investment as well, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, Queensland is the energy powerhouse of the nation, Mr Speaker. We have the most efficient coal-fired power fleet in the country, Mr Speaker. We have abundance of gas, Mr Speaker, and where other states are very reluctant to open their gas reserves, we have progressively been opening up more gas reserves, especially for domestic consumption, because we know that gas is that transitional um, uh, source of energy that is needed to, dr to drive many of our large industrial projects, of course, which is um, necessary for the jobs in our state, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, I was very pleased uh, to join uh, the local members uh, for the Townsville region, as well as the Deputy Premier, the Minister for Energy, Mr Speaker, to, uh, uh, as well as many energy stakeholders to announce our $2 billion commitment for renewable energy. Mr Speaker, this is a game changer. This is Queensland leading the way. But also, too, when we're talking about uh, the future for this state, 
Hydrogen is a great opportunity where we can actually uh, produce that renewable green hydrogen here and export it to markets across the world, Mr Speaker. And that means uh, our great trading partners like Japan, South Korea, and of course looking at what Europe's doing as well with hydrogen when it comes to um, countries like Germany. And I think even the federal government now is on the bandwagon. They're even talking hydrogen as well. But it was Queensland that first started talking about hydrogen, and uh, Dr Finkel also commended right. our investment in this area. And whilst we believe that our assets should stay in public hands, those opposite have a completely different view, Mr Speaker. They want to sell Order. Mr Speaker. They, you know, they, they, time and time again, they always have their secret plans to sell off the assets. And where would Queenslanders be today? You actually went to an election on it. You actually went to an election. And, and to those members interjecting, for those members interjecting, have a good long look at where you are sitting in this house. Have a good look. Premier's time has expired. Premier's time has expired. I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. A question to the Treasurer. Three weeks ago, the Treasurer said the titles office was worth $4.2 billion. Yesterday, he said it was worth $7.8 billion. Members interjecting, there will be one warning only today. Questions will be heard in silence. Uh, you can start your question again, Member. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Three weeks ago, the Treasurer said the titles office was worth $4.2 billion. Yesterday, he said it was worth $7.8 billion. Can the Treasurer produce the valuation and the assumptions on which it was made? I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I thank the member for Toowoomba South for his question? Uh, can I also say I did not uh, say that three weeks ago? Your assertion is wrong. Can I reaffirm uh, through the, to chair, the House? Member what I said uh, yesterday. As yesterday's state budget noted, the $7.8 billion valuation of our titles registry, the best run and the most valuable in the Commonwealth, is, is the result of detailed due diligence undertaken by the Queensland Investment Corporation and Queensland Treasury. Now, as I said in the budget speech less than 24 hours ago, Speaker, QIC obtained advice from four independent firms financial advisory services from Bank of America, macroeconomic forecasting from BIS Economics, Oxford Economics, financial... Sorry, tax... sorry, Treasurer. Uh, members to my left, uh, I've been pretty clear when members are responding to the question asked uh, in a manner which is providing information to the House. I need to hear that answer. Uh, I believe the Treasurer is responding to the question. Uh, Treasurer, you have the call. Thank you, Speaker. Macroeconomic forecasting from BIS Oxford Economics financial tax accounting and information technology due diligence from Deloitte, legal advice from Allen's Linklaters, one of the largest law firms in the world. The valuation was approved by QIC's Independent Investment Committee, was then subject to two further independent peer assessments by two global accounting firms, PwC on behalf of QIC and EY on behalf of the state. Speaker, I know the member for Toowoomba South had a storied financial career when he worked for the Heritage Building Society on the Downs, Speaker. A great Queensland company. But I'll tell you this, Speaker. I'll tell you this, Speaker. I will back the Bank of America, BIS Oxford Economics, Deloitte, Allen Links later, PwC and EY against the storied financial career of the member for Toowoomba South. And I heard the Leader and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition yesterday saying saying yesterday leader of the opposition saying yesterday it was a fraud speaker it was a fraud it was tricked up well i my challenge to the lnp today is this speaker i challenge the leader of the opposition and the deputy leader of opposition immediately out of out of this question time to go outside the front of this parliament and say in relation to tom seymour the ceo of pwc in queensland and alison de groot the managing director the Brisbane managing partner for EY, I want you to say publicly... Uh, through the chair, Treasurer. I want you to say that, Speaker, because you will get a defamation writ 
fast. Post fast. the clock. Post the clock. The level of interjection is too high. Treasurer, uh, you will direct your comments through the chair or I will sit you down. Thank you, Speaker. I challenge the LNP to do that because the LNP will get a writ faster than anything else, Speaker. And I will back the professional competence and expertise of those companies. I will back them every day of the year. Some of the largest legal and financial accounting firms in the world against the storied financial career of the member for Toowoomba South every day of the week. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, similarly, if you will not put your comments through the chair, you will be warned. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Caloundra. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Premier and Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on the Palaszczuk government's commitment to the Sunshine Coast through this week's state budget? Yeah. Yeah. I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Caloundra for that question, Mr Speaker, because you know, for many, many years um, there have been a lot of LNP members up there on the Sunshine Coast and have delivered not much at all for the Sunshine Coast, Mr Speaker. It's a very, very sad story indeed. All those members and what have they got to show for it, Mr Speaker? What have they got to show for it? You know, a bit of complacency over there, a bit sleepy, you know, not really hard working, Mr Speaker. No, not much at all, Mr. Speaker. And they're all, you know, bit of interjection. Member for Nanango, member for Nindri. And the member for Nanango is not even on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me say this. Let, let, let me. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, on this side, Member the House, Nango is warned under standing orders. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so proud we've got two new members on the Sunshine yeah, yeah, yeah. Coast. What a fine member the member for Cloundra is, and the member for Nicklin, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. S and Mr. S no one says it about you, Member for. <laughs> Through the chair, Premier. But I think, Mr. Speaker, we're building a brand new school in Budrum, a new high school, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking. Pause the clock, Premier. 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 Premier, please resume your seat, um, Member for Budrum. Your interjections are simply loud. <laughs> you warned understanding orders. Premier, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud in this budget we're going to build a brand new high school in Budrum, Mr. Speaker. I'll be up there, Mr. Speaker, a lot, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, let's get back to uh, some other issues we're doing up there on the Sunshine Coast. I can confirm that we're investing $160 million to deliver a major upgrade of the Malula River interchange, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister was up there just last week talking that up, Mr. Speaker. We're very pleased to be supporting that, Mr. Speaker. And we're delivering more than $3.9 billion in joint funding for roads and rail on the Sunshine Coast. This includes $7 million to extend the 3rd Avenue to Nicklin Way at Caloundra, $3.75 million for traffic lights at the intersection of Steve Irwin Way and Caloundra Road, $35 million for the Bells Creek Arterial Extension. What a great project that is. I remember we were up there, the member for Caloundra, myself and the minister, turning the sod on that, watching that go. That's fantastic. And $160 million to build the first stage of the Sunshine Coast Line duplication between Beer Burham and Beerwa. And of course, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to education and schools, there are so many schools being built on the Sunshine Coast because that corridor is just so fast growing. We're making sure we've got the primary schools, the secondary schools, Mr. Speaker. And I know, look, the, the Minister for Education is spending so much time up there. She may as well get a second home up there because there's so many schools that are being built. So on this side of the house, we back, we back the Premier's the time has expired. The transport and, of course, health. I call the member for Everton. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Housing. The $1 billion housing investment fund appears on page 141 of the budget, but there is no funding allocation for this fund. Can the minister advise where is the money? Before calling the minister, the member for Nicklin, you are warned under standing orders. I call the minister. I thank the member for the question, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and honestly, the member for Everton has got more front than Maya uh, turning up here, asking a question about housing and investment in housing. This is a record amount of funding that has been invested in social housing. It's the 
It is the largest concentrated investment in social housing. In social housing, this state has ever Order. seen, Mr. Speaker. This state has ever seen. Now, what I might suggest to uh, the member for Evident, who was apparently the former shadow treasurer for the opposition, um, he might want to like go and refresh his YouTube channels and like get a little bit of tutorial around how you actually do this sort of stuff. Uh, but of course, that fund has been set up. It's the first of its kind in this state. It's being set up for the future. In the meantime, what we're seeing is a $1.9 billion investment in social housing over the next four years. Uh, what that's going to deliver, Mr Speaker, what that is going to deliver, Mr Speaker, is uh, more than 7,000 social and affordable homes over the next four years. That is an incredible amount of, of properties that we're going to see uh, brought into the system. Not only are we going to see those social homes being built, the Premier and the Treasurer mentioned those, some three, uh, 6,365. On top opposition. of that, more than 1,000 affordable homes over the next four years. On top of that, head leasing of over around 1,000 uh, properties over the next four years. On top of that, uh, an accelerated partnerships with the community housing sector to see even more stock in the system. That's what this $1.9 billion investment is all about. And the, the Housing Investment Fund is about the future. Leader of the Opposition will cease his $160 million over the next four years will be drawn down. And of course, we'll see this fund be able to support uh, to support this work into the future. This is an incredible amount of investment. Uh, page 13, I'll take that interjection, page 13 of the highlights makes it very clear, Member for Evident. But of course, Member for Evident, Member for Evident completely forgets what he was the what he was the leader of when he was the housing minister for the LNP. What we saw from him, what we saw from the member for Evident was some very embarrassing shrinkage. Treasurer will cease his interjection. Very embarrassing shrinkage which it comes to social housing. Very noticeable, very noticeable and very embarrassing shrinkage from the member for Evident. He, quite frankly, Mr Speaker, the guy's got more front the member for Evident has got more front than mine turning up here talking about housing, asking any question about investment when we saw housing go backwards. Member for Evident will cease his interjections. Mr Speaker, this government is committed to housing, it's committed to social and affordable housing, and you see that point in the of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, point of order. What is your point of order? I rise on a matter of privilege suddenly arising, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer, in a previous answer, said three weeks ago he didn't mention the valuation of $4.2 billion. I table a copy uh, for your reference that I'll be writing to you, Speaker, from three weeks ago, Hansard, for Mr Dick, which I assume is Treasurer Dick, uh, talking about the 4.2 valuation. Speaker. On a point of, uh, a point of order, on a matter of privilege arising, what, what, Speaker, yes, what, is your what point I did of order? say in that debate was wait for the budget, and they've got the valuation yesterday. Speaker. Uh, it's not an opportunity to debate the matter. Uh, I'll consider uh, any correspondence uh, from the Manager of Opposition Business and I'll give it consideration at that time. Uh, also, uh, the uh, member for Bancroft uh, was previously interjecting on a, uh, a question being asked. Uh, you're warned under standing orders also. Uh, I call the member for Bundaberg. Thank you, Speaker. Third time lucky. Uh, Speaker, my question is of the Deputy Premier. Can the Deputy Premier update the House on how the budget is delivering for Queensland councils, especially in my great region of Bundaberg, and is he aware of any alternatives? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Bundaberg uh, for his very good question, because the Palestine government is proud to be working with local governments right across this state to deliver much-needed community infrastructure. And uh, you heard from the Premier in her ministerial statement how the budget has been warmly welcomed by mayors right across this state. We are working with local governments to deliver local stimulus because we know that they are often best placed to know what communities need and to deliver those projects quickly and in the process creating jobs in local communities. And uh, in the budget was our $200 million next round of the very popular Works for Queensland program, now a $1 billion program. And this round alone will deliver 333 projects across our great state, creating 3,600 jobs for Queenslanders and leaving a legacy of important community infrastructure like like the 50-metre Olympic standard 
pool in Bundaberg and the Associated Aquatic Centre that I know uh, the member for Bundaberg was proud to announce with uh, the Assistant Minister, uh, the member for Pine Rivers and that great fan of the Palaszczuk government, the Mayor of Bundaberg, Mr Jack Dempsey. And the three of them were able to announce how that wonderful project would allow the young people of Bundaberg to, to train with the dream of competing in the 2032 uh, Queensland Olympics, uh, Mr Speaker. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What a wonderful opportunity for, for Bundaberg locals. We also expect that it will attract uh, teams as a training venue, potential training venue, in the lead up to that event. A great uh, opportunity for Bundaberg. Mr Speaker, right across the state we are partnering with local governments to deliver better local community infrastructure. And that's starkly different to the approach that the member for Broadwater had when he was the local government minister. He proudly announced that local government was on their own, that they shouldn't look to the state government for financial support, that if they want to invest in their communities they should sell their land and their assets. And then he proceeded to cut $60 million of local government grants. Mr Speaker, the Palaszczuk government will not do that. We will continue to invest in works for Queensland projects like the pump track in Harvey Bay, the pump track in Mackay, the national level skate park in Townsville, uh, the skate park and recreational facilities in Roma, the playground at the Rockhampton Botanic Gardens. In fact, all of those projects funded by the Palaszczuk government. Mr. Speaker. Sorry, before calling member, Leader of the Opposition, you're warned under standing orders. You're not using members' correct titles. You're not directing your comments through the chair. Uh, you will cease interjections. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Bonnie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question to the Environment Minister. The $500 million carbon reduction investment fund appears next to a blank line in the budget. There is no funding allocation for this fund. Can the Minister tell the House where is the money? I call the Minister for Environment. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I don't know how many times we need to explain this today to the opposition for them to understand, but I'll put it in simple terms. When you have, when you have an investment fund, it generates returns, and those Order. returns. Then, Minister has the call. Those returns are then invested into the source in which we have set the Land Restoration Fund, where we've made a commitment to spend $500 million. Now, we've made a commitment uh, in this budget to deliver $60 million for the Land Restoration Fund. That's on top of the first round that we've already announced. But those opposite have some nerve coming into this House wanting to talk about carbon reduction, because we, of course, we know that they've got a number of very interesting views when it comes to emissions reduction. We had the member for Clayfield. We know. Uh, some terms ago say that people who have rooftop solar and are inner city latte sippers. I'd like him to tell that to the people in Bundaberg who have the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the state. We also had the member for Burley who said that acting on climate and reducing emissions will mean plants die and will go back to the ice age. We've got the member for Calide who said the renewable energy is a fantasy. It might be a fantasy for those opposite, but on this side of the house we spend $2 billion. And we also have, of course, the Leader of the Opposition who went to the last election proposing to scrap our targets altogether. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, it is interesting to see that some people on the opposition do uh, at least acknowledge the science behind climate change. Member for Mudgerabar, uh, Caesar Interjections. Those opposite went to the last... Pause the clock. Please resume your seat, Minister. Please resume your seat, Minister. Member for Mudgerabar. I ask you to cease interjecting. You continue to do so. You warned other standing orders. Um, it's not helpful doing it on your own. Point of order, Chief. What is your point of order? The unparliamentary nature of that call out. Oh, please resume your seat, Minister. I call the Minister for Environment. Mr Speaker, I, uh, there's an interesting Facebook post by the member for Bonnie who pretends to be really progressive but comes into this House and votes against things like sensible tree clearing laws, which actually have an impact on emissions reduction, termination of pregnancy, human there's a range of different bills that he's voted against despite his so-called progressive, progressive nature. But this Facebook post says uh, he, he went to a session with Dr Carl and it says, if you know someone who denies the scientific consensus, let me know and I'll give you my old copy to pass it on. 
to them. So, Mr Speaker, I've brought two there copies into the House today. I think the member for Calide probably needs it the most, but I'll table a copy so all of those opposite can read about the science of climate change. Of course, we have a very proud track record on this side of the House in investing in uh, the Member environment, for investing we'll in renewable energy. I was with the Minister for Energy, the Deputy Premier and Premier in Townsville recently, where we announced the $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen fund that will turbocharge renewable energy in this space. We know some of the biggest impacts to the Great Barrier Reef are climate change. That's why we need to invest in this space. Those opposite like to talk, but they don't walk the walk. We know at the last election, at the last election, they did not commit to the Land Restoration Fund. They did not commit to emissions reduction targets. They don't deliver when it comes to the environment. Uh, Member for Bonnie, you're one of the standing orders. I gave you several opportunities to uh, cease uh, the interjections. You did not do so. Speaker. I call the member for Lytton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is of the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Will the Treasurer please up to advise the House on the budget's projects on when the Queensland Government will return to, oper to operating surplus and is he aware of any alternative forecast? I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank uh, the member for Lytton for her question? Uh, and I trust uh, she's pleased to see the initiatives being rolled out in her electorate, including extra classrooms at uh, Darling Point and also Manly State uh, Schools, two very fine schools on the Bayside. Uh, speaker, the budget I handed down yesterday uh, uh, demonstrates how government is investing in infrastructure and services while setting us on a path to surplus. Of the big four governments in Australia, the federal government, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, we are the first to publish a return to surplus. Speaker. And that, of course, is in the financial year, uh, commencing 1 July 2024. Speaker. And of course, that's because of the growing strength of our economy. And I read out a little bit earlier today some of the uh, strong uh, positive comments we've received about our uh, economy. Speaker, and uh, there's one that I missed, and, and this was a comment made yesterday. Look, I think what we are seeing is that the people of Queensland are bouncing back. You know, we are seeing people wanting to move here. That's great for our state. It's a great place to be living, and it's pleasing to see people wanting to move here. We know the housing market is strong. And we know retail spending is strong, and that's being led by the people of Queensland. Member for Toowoomba South, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Speaker, thanks for the endorsement. But of course, they do have a problem about getting back to surplus, because yesterday both the Leader and the Deputy Leader said we would not see a surplus until after the next state election. I don't know who needs to hear this, but the 2024 state election is in October, Speaker. And October, strangely enough, comes after July. July is 7, October is 10, 10 comes after 7, Speaker, and uh, I'm a bit disappointed in them, a bit disappointed in the Leader and the Deputy Speaker. As I said, Deputy Leader, storied career in finance, knows a bit about numbers up there on the downs. He should know when the financial year begins, Speaker. He should know that, Speaker. The Leader of Opposition ought to know that the election is in October, and between the two of them, they ought to know that the budget will be in surplus in the year of the election. It will be in surplus by October 2024. Look, Speaker, we saw it last week. We saw the Leader, up in the, leader of the Opposition up in Rockhampton saying the government needs to borrow more. Remember when he was on Channel 7? Up in Rockhampton, the EMU Park Epiphany Speaker. And then when he came down here, he says something to a different audience. Wants to rag it up in regional Queensland, but won't bag it up down here. Of course, because the LNP are an absolute bunch of phonies. That's what they are. An absolute bunch of phonies, Speaker. Say anything to any audience. Make it up. Denigrate some great accounting firms here in Queensland. Do whatever they have to. Do whatever they have to. Undermine the budget. Do whatever they have to, because it suits their political purposes, Mr Speaker. This isn't leadership from the member for, for Broadwater, Speaker. This is, just, this is just a game to him. Just a game to him, because we know what they'll do in government. Cut, sack and the power, which time is always their agenda. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Condamine. Mr Speaker, a question to the Energy Minister. The Treasurer promised a $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund, but half the fund doesn't have a funding allocation in the budget. Minister, where is the money? Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to, um, to rephrase the last part of your question. Where is the money? Can the minister say where the money is? Thank you. I call the minister. <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the 
Member for Condamine, uh, the, uh, the shadow minister who really puts the word shadow into his uh, title. Uh, of course, um, uh, budget paper two is pretty clear. I'm sure the member uh, has studied it, as uh, uh, the, the Minister for the Environment pointed out. I think on page uh, 147 you'll find the, you'll find the, uh, the money uh, outlined there. Uh, I'm wondering if the members had a chance to uh, take a close look at that. Uh, now, it starts off uh, this year with $100 million. Uh, uh, further $200 million next year, $100 million the following year, another $100 million on top of the $500 million already uh, committed to the Queensland uh, Renewable Energy Fund, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker but uh, as members on this side of the House can appreciate, as members on Treasurer this side of the House can appreciate, significant renewable energy and hydrogen projects take some time to build, Mr Speaker. And we heard uh, from the Minister for the Environment, she talked about the uh, the, uh, the, the nerve, and we heard from the Minister for Housing about the front, Mr. Speaker, and we heard collectively about the shrinkage over there. And if you want to talk about shrinkage, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to investment in large-scale renewable uh, energy projects, Mr. Speaker, this is why those opposite have no clue when it comes to investing in this state, because, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, they built nothing in their term in office, Mr. Speaker. When we look at the, the, the examples from housing, Mr. Speaker, the member for Evident, when he was Minister for Housing. He shrunk investment in housing to 148 homes, a measly 148 homes. And then has the front to come in here, come in here and say well, that we should do more. Well, we are doing more, Mr. Speaker. We are doing more, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Uh, and during their during their term, Mr. Speaker, during their term, during their term, Mr. Speaker, investment in large-scale renewable projects, be they wind, solar. Hydrogen, pumped hydro, Mr. Speaker. What did it go to? What did it shrink to? Nothing. Nothing. Not a single large-scale renewable project in this state under those opposite, Mr. Speaker. Not only that, not only that, Mr. Speaker. We know what their plan was. We know what their plan was in their unholy alliance with the Greens political party, Mr. Speaker, which was to sell off Queensland's power assets, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to delivering a two billion dollar fund. We'll cease these interjections. A two billion dollar fund, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that government-owned corporations can invest in cheaper, cleaner energy for Queensland, Mr. Speaker. That's our record, and we've seen, Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, a 22 per cent reduction in wholesale energy prices because of our investment, our investment in Queensland-owned corporations. Under those opposite, Mr. Speaker, no investment in renewables, Mr. Speaker, and a 43 per cent business crippling, job, job crippling increase in electricity prices, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. I call the member for Stafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations, and Minister for Racing. Will the minister outline how the Palaszczuk government's record education spend will benefit Queensland school students, particularly in my electorate of Stafford, and is she aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Minister for Education. I thank the member for Stafford, and because I know education is a big part of what he went to the election with in October, and he got elected, returned with increased majority. It's an amazing, um, um, you know, when you consider when we went out with what we had done, not only were we returned to government and those are still on the other side of the House, we came back with an increased majority. And part of that is because what we've put into education, seven record budgets, seven record budgets, and it is incredible. And I am so proud to be delivering the infrastructure in all of the electorates in this House, particularly the $8 million school hall at Wilston State School, which I know they've been waiting for and that the member for Stafford advocated very strongly, and a new outdoor learning centre at Kedron State High School, which will really revolutionise that school learning, and around $650,000 in minor works and maintenance just in the Stafford electorate alone. An incredible amount of money, a $15.3 billion, um, billion dollar spend investing in our education. We will deliver more schools, we will deliver more classrooms, and we're rolling out also our election commitments that we made 
in October, where we were returned to this House Speaker with an increased majority. Can I say that we are rolling out the $100 million health and wellbeing project, and we are looking for psychologists and um, mental health student professionals, and we'll be investing in the first stage of that. Um, it's $100 million over three years. That's right. Not all the money is allocated in this financial year. It's over the three years as you employ and build up. The line of questioning about the other um, amounts of money is really quite interesting coming from those opposite, not understanding how budgets work. But we will be employing um, the 109 new wellbeing student mental health professionals right throughout Queensland. And if you are a psychologist or a mental health professional, I urge you to um, apply for those positions. Um, speaker, we're also rolling out the homework centres, and they've been incredibly successful. We're rolling out 120 this financial year, and already we've had 109 applications. So we're looking forward to rolling those out and the 20 GP clinics as well. And you don't have to look far to look at the contrast between us and them. Teacher numbers increasing, teacher aid numbers increasing, cleaner number incre increasing, infrastructure more than three times the amount that it dipped to in the 14-15 budget delivered by the LNP. And they um, continue to whinge about a budget that sets records that is far beyond anything they could ever plan or see into the future. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Surface Paradise. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A question to the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. The budget details reveal there is no funding allocated to the Path to Treaty Fund. Where is the money? I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, we're going to have to really go back to really basic maths here. Um, the, the, treasurer, the Treasurer outlined this quite simply, and then the Minister for Housing has also outlined this quite simply, and then the Minister for the Environment did it quite simply, and then the Minister for Energy did it, but I'll, take it, I'll dumb it down even further. <laughs> it's like, remember when you were in school and you had the dolomite accounts, right? the Commonwealth Government dolomite accounts, and what you did is you took some money, and for some of us they were gold coins, and for some it might have been pennies, but you put the money in the bank and the bank gave you some interest. And then with the interest, you then did some stuff. OK? Can I make it any simpler? Can I make it any simpler, Mr Speaker? This is a future fund. This is a future fund. And just like the questions that we've seen, this is the LNP just simply playing, playing with words and playing games. But can I talk about the significance of this investment order, the treaty, Mr. Speaker. Order, Minister has the call. And in doing so, can I can I reflect? Can I reflect on Who's on our opposition and, uh, and and their run? Can we can we have a look at their term in government? Cutting funding to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health sector, abolishing the Murray courts. The Indigenous Drug and Special Circumstances Court. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. And you just Minister, Minister, please resume your jobs. seat. There's a point of order. What is your point of order? Number eight B relevance. The question was purely around the budget that was delivered by the Labor government yesterday and the lack of allocated funding pursuant to the question I asked the minister. The minister be brought back to the question asked. Uh, yeah, the question, uh, Minister, was reasonably specific about a particular line item in the budget, so I would ask you to return to that or the uh, matter or the issue, policy issue that is um, being referred to. I call the Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Um, let's talk about treaty. Mr Speaker, this is a $300 million future fund investment that we will draw down on the revenue that we earn from that to fund treaty. Where was the LNP's commitment to treaty in the lead up to the last election? Where was it? Did the word exist? Were there any, were there any commitments from the LNP in the last election in relation to treaty, in relation to First Nations housing, education, health, employment? Nothing. Zip, diddly, nothing. Mr Speaker, the LNP still have not made a decision as to whether they support a path to treaty. I've Order. Left 
I have written to the Leader of the Opposition. I am waiting for a reply. I don't want to play politics on this. I want this to be a bipartisan approach. We want this to be bipartisan. I want this to be supported by all parts of this House, including the crossbench. This is too big for us to play politics on. I urge the Opposition to support Trudy. Uh, I call the member for Kapalaba. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Health and the Minister for Ambulance Service. Can the Minister outline how the Palaszczuk government is supporting our hard-working hospital and health services through the 2021-2022 uh, budget? I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Kapalaba for his question. I know he uh, is very supportive of the great work that our hospital and health services do and our wonderful health uh, staff right across the state. Uh, Mr Speaker, a record overall health budget for 21-22, $22.2 billion, a record budget for every one of our 16 hospital and health services. Now, Mr Speaker, those opposite uh, over the last couple of weeks have been running around claiming uh, that we were cutting, shrinking the HHS budgets by $550 million. And while those on the other side like to talk about uh, shrinkage, we like to talk about growth. And that's what we are going to see across every one of our hospital and health services. Mr Speaker, can I make it clear what the budget papers will show those opposite in black and white? Record funding for every HHS. Cairns and Hinterland, $1.08 billion, up $30 million, 2.9 per cent increase. Central Queensland, $691 million, up $30 million, 4.5 per cent increase. Central West, $89.9 million, up $3.9 million, a 4.5 per cent increase. Children's Health Queensland, $898 million, up $27.6 million, a 3.2 per cent increase. Darling Downs, $937 million, up $35.8 million, a 4 per cent increase. Gold Coast, $1.77 billion, up $78.7 million, a 4.6 per cent increase. Mackay, $514 million, up $21.5 million, or 4.4 per cent increase. Metro North, $3.36 billion up $147 million, a 4.6 per cent increase. Metro South, $2.27 billion, up $105 million, 3.9 per cent increase. North West, $207 million, up $8 million, a 4 per cent increase. South West, $169 million, up $3.4 million, a 2.1 per cent increase. Sunshine Coast, $136 billion, up $51.9 million, 4 per cent increase. Torres Strait, $250 million up 9.9 million, a 4.1 per cent increase. Townsville, 1.12 billion, up 32.1 million dollars, a 2.9 per cent increase. West Morton, 750 million, up 59.4 million, an 8.6 per cent increase. And Wide Bay, 724 million, up 32.6 million, a 4.7 per cent increase. Mr Speaker, we are very proud of a 22.2 billion dollar budget for this year for 2021-22 in this budget and we thank the premier and her leadership and the treasurer in leading a strong labor budget and a strong labor budget for health showing our continued investment growth in capital infrastructure investing in our health workforce that's what labor governments do yeah. i call the member for Moroni. mr speaker my question is to the treasurer could the treasurer update the house on the the way the government will extract royalties out of the green hydrogen industry that Queenslanders are paying millions into at the moment in investment. I call the Treasurer. I thank the member for Moroni for his question, as Speaker. And of course, we want to be a first mover when it comes to the hydrogen industry developing in Australia and around the world. And uh, I think, uh, as the member for Moroni might acknowledge, uh, we were the first state jurisdiction to develop a hydrogen industry development plan. Uh, and we're now rolling that out with an additional $2.6 uh, $2 million in this, uh, in this budget to support the uh, hydrogen industry uh, task force, uh, in which the, uh, led by the Deputy Premier, supported by the Minister for Energy and myself uh, and other ministers, to ensure we can be part of that. Of course, uh, developing uh, the income stream from that industry is dependent on developing the industry first. So we have to be the first mover. We have to try and keep our advantage. But what green hydrogen in particular offers for Queensland is a new energy source that the world is now demanding. 
our big trading partners in uh, Japan and South Korea, also in China, also in Europe and in the United States, they're looking for lower carbon energy. Uh, that's the reality. We have what the world needs. We have an abundance of land and we have an abundance of sunshine. You put those two together, you can create renewable energy. As I've said on many occasions, you use that renewable energy to crack water. You take off the H2. Uh, there is no carbon produced in that energy source. Uh, and then when you burn it, it just ends up as steam again. And it's potentially a very virtuous energy cycle. Having said that, you'll see the investments in our budget to support our traditional industries as well, to support our traditional industries, particularly in mining, supporting our coal industry, supporting our new economy, uh, minerals industries and the resource industry development plan that the Minister for Resources is leading as well to make sure that cobalt, zinc, uh, vanadium, uh, copper that we are blessed with in this state uh, and in this nation, one of the few places in the world where all of those new economy minerals, uh, particularly those that are used for the uh, production of electric engines, uh, can, be can be delivered, uh, to, can be sourced, delivered and we hope uh, uh, used for manufacturing purposes in the one place. So there's a long way to go yet, Member for Morani, uh, but what you see in our government is backing the old, backing the traditional and also investing in the new. And that's what our economy needs. The reason we have been able to sustain such a strong economic recovery is because of the diversified nature of the Queensland economy. And we must keep diversifying that economy, whether it is the tourism industry, whether it is the traditional mining and agricultural sectors who have done so much of the heavy lifting uh, during the last year or so, or whether it is those new industries, defence industries, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, the space industry itself, green hydrogen, renewable energy. Our, our vision is for Queensland to be a renewable energy superpower. We want to provide that renewable energy to the world. And as our friends uh, in Japan say, they want sunshine in a suitcase that they, we can send overseas that they can use. And so this presents, presents enormous potential for our state, which is why we'll continue to invest in it. Mr. Speaker, call the member for Logan. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister for Communities and Housing, Minister for the Digital Economy, and the Minister for the Arts. Will the minister update the House about the government's investment in social and affordable housing in this year's budget? Call the minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Logan for his question and for his advocacy with regards to social housing and affordable housing in his electorate. And I want to add my uh, appreciation and acknowledgement to all members on this side who have very strongly advocated for further investment in social and affordable housing. And we are all very, very proud as a Labor government to be delivering this $2.9 billion investment, the largest concentration of social housing investment uh, this state has ever seen. And of course, as I've made it already, as I've already made it very clear, uh, this is made up of both uh, a $1.9 billion investment over four years, uh, which will see uh, a number of uh, opportunities to see uh, our housing expanded, and of course we, that is incredibly important, but also the establishment of a once, uh, as a, sorry, also the establishment of a first of its kind uh, housing investment fund, a $1 billion housing investment fund. Now I know that the opposition, the LNP, don't really get it but stakeholders get it. Uh, this is about s establishing self-sustaining funds that can be used well into the future to invest in renewable energy, uh, protecting the Great Barrier Reef, supporting the path to treaty, and of course, uh, building social housing for our most vulnerable Queenslanders. Uh, these actions uh, will support thousands of jobs and have been welcomed by stakeholders. CCIQ welcomed the $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund. Queensland Conservation Council uh, absolutely supported the, uh, um, uh, the announcement. And of course, QCOS welcomed the $2.9 billion housing commitment, saying we were committed to tripling the number of social homes built each and every year. And so stakeholders get it, Mr. Speaker. But in terms of the question from the member from Logan with regards to social and affordable housing, not only are we seeing this $2.9 billion investment, what we're seeing also this week is the release of our latest um, housing action plan. Uh, this housing action plan absolutely drives the idea of getting more investment into our sector, getting more properties into the sector so that we can house vulnerable Queenslanders sooner. And of course, we can't talk about uh, social housing without talking about the LNP and what they actually left for us. And of course, the member for Evident, who was the architect, the architect of the wholesale giveaway of publicly owned assets in this state, the epicentre being Logan. Member for Evident is 
warned Speaker, understanding orders. Uh, when those opposites went in government, we saw a net decrease in the total number of social housing dwellings in Queensland by 428. That's 428 less properties when they left government than when they started. And we had to build those back and build on top of that. We're very proud that this $2.9 billion investment will see more than 7,400 properties over the next four years. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Traeger. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Resources. There is near consensus that global demand for the minerals produced by the North West Mineral Province will see unprecedented increases over the next 30 years. Will the Minister please advise whether the Government is forecasting annual mineral production from the North West Minerals Province to increase to 2050? I call the Minister for Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for the question, because we know how important the North West Minerals Province is, particularly to Queensland's economy. And we know that mining will be a key component when we um, go forward with our economic recovery post-COVID-19. So what we're currently developing at the moment, Member for Traegar, is our Resource Industry Development Plan. This is where we've been working with industry, we've been working with um, uh, people in, in the, uh, in the um, resources industry, the workers, we've been working with the unions, we've been working with environmental people, uh, a, a really broad smattering of people right across um, the, the industry and the impacts. This plan is actually developing a 30-year plan of where do we need to be in our resource sector. What are the key components that will be impacting upon us over the next 30 years? So what I'm doing is, with our resource industry key people, is getting them to crystal ball. We know that there's been, over the last 30 years, some massive changes in the industry, but we also need to prepare for the massive changes that we will see. And we know that, particularly in the North West Minerals Province, and as the Treasurer has already highlighted, it is absolutely blessed with the new economy in minerals, the vanadium, the copper, uh, the scandium, um, the, the nickel, the cobalt. So these are all the essential uh, new minerals that we will go into the future, particularly when it comes to that battery production. And what we need to do is position ourselves particularly as leaders in that sector. When I talk about this, um, there is a, uh, Mr Speaker, there is this huge um, movement, particularly in Europe, around ethically sourced minerals. And there will certainly be a future for ethically sourced minerals. Now, our biggest competitors in this space, a member for Traegar, is China and Congo. Now, I will bet London to a brick that we have better ethically sourced product than any of those two countries. But our job is, how do we put this into those markets? How do we position ourselves? How do we tell the rest of the world that we've got the, the best minerals that you can get out of our northwest minerals province, that we've got the best workers who are absolutely smart as a tack around this sort of stuff, that we have got some of the best environmental protections in the world, and we've got some of the strongest um, workplace health and safety legislation in the world to protect their workers to make sure that they come out of their shift each and every day. But it's also working with those proponents around how do we set this up. And Mr Speaker, what we want to do is how do we prepare our future kids who are sitting in our classrooms today Speaker, for those jobs? Order. Uh, pause, pause the clock. Uh, Mr Traeger, what is your point of order? Uh, Mr. Po uh, relevance, Mr Speaker, I'm just, I'm just narrowing down on that um, question said, would, would there be forecasting to increase? And uh, with, with respect, that's a good answer, but there just needs to be some uh, relevance. Please, please resume your seat. Uh, the question was longer than simply the, um, that one pit with a reasonable preamble. Uh, the Minister uh, will continue with his answer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, and when it comes to our kids who are sitting in our, in our classrooms today, what's the future for them? How do we create future careers for them in a really safe environment, but know that we are producing the best in the world. So, Member for Traegar, we will continue to work with companies about looking at those opportunities because we've Minister's got the best product expired. in the world. Mr Speaker. I call the Member for Cook. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Seniors and Disability Services and Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Will the Minister update the House on how the Palaszczuk Government is working with the wider Australian community and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples through Path to Treaty? Uh, Minister, you have one minute to respond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Cook for the question. I know that this is significantly important to her uh, and to Torres Strait Islanders and Aboriginal people uh, of this state. Mr Speaker, uh, on the weekend I was up at Cooktown and uh, I went to an event up at Cooktown hosted by the Cook Shire. 
Um, there was a significant event up there about a story around reconciliation and something that a lot of people probably have not heard about, and I'll quickly cover it. When Cook landed there in 1770, he, was, he, he and the ship were there for 48 days repairing a, a broken ship. There was a, a, a situation where 12 turtles had been taken on board that ship uh, by Cook's crew. Uh, they were, those turtles were found by local Indigenous uh, people from the Cook uh, town area, and there was quite a, a, a bit of a, a, an issue arose uh, over custom and practice. Um, that turned out to be a quite a significant uh, event where, had it had not been stopped, it would have ended up um, causing significant bloodshed. Mr Speaker, a little old man came out of the bush. He resolved that, um, and it was a first act of reconciliation in this country. This is what treaty is about. Minister's time has expired. The period for question time has expired. Uh, I call the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I rise.